Hello, my name is J.R. Pepper and I'm one of the New York Odd Salon Fellows. I'm currently quarantined at my home in Brooklyn, New York, which means I'm right in the middle of all this craziness. And means that the appropriate reading material for quarantine should be somebody that had a similar circumstance. So in that, with that in mind, didst thou reads my blog, The Plague Journals of Samuel Pepys. In the days before social media, blogs, gossip columnists, Us Magazine, and tell old books, people kept journals to describe their day-to-day. -day. But what if your day-to-day -day involves living in one of the most bizarre and devastating plagues in human history? Samuel Pepys took this opportunity to journal the mundane, the devastation, as well as his womanizing, and the local gossip in a series of journals that he wrote from 1660 to 1669. Ta-da, here we go. Samuel Pepys was born February 23rd in 1633 and died in May of 1703. He served as a naval administrator with no maritime or military experience and quickly rose to the ranks because frankly he did all the work and administrative stuff that nobody else really wanted to do. It didn't hurt that he actually was buddies with King Charles II and King James II, yada yada yada. We don't know him for that. What we do know him for are his extensive journals that he wrote from 1660 to 1669. He kept an extensive private diary that remains one of the most referred to historical documents of all time. The problem, or perhaps the most interesting part about this, is that, well, he didn't really expect anyone to read them. So that means not only did he include all the historical tidbits that are great for your AP history course, it also means that he recorded about his various affairs, both financial and sexual. Uh, with that in mind, he also wrote about the everyday, the boring stuff, like playing matchmaker for his neighbors, how much he hated his job, his disappointments at the pubs being closed. Sound familiar? Oh yeah, and also his extensive sex dreams and his consistent cheating on his wife. We'll get back to that later. But he also details silly things like theater reviews. For example, this review from 1662 where he went to the King's Theater to see A Midsummer's Night Dream in which he describes, nor shall I ever see it again, for it is the most insipid, ridiculous play that I ever saw in my life. Seems like he was more of a Marlowe fan. He was also a bit of a sext addict, and he used these journals as a means to explain his various liaisons and sexual proclivities, kind of penthouse letter style for the wig wearing set. And it was all coded in a specific language of all his own, in which he used a mixture of French and Spanish and an amalgamation of English words to describe the particularly racy parts of his journals. So in case his wife happened to see it, maybe she'd be confused and not pay it any mind. For example, this quote here from 1662 illustrates Samuel Pepys being so aroused by seeing a woman's petticoats that he felt the need to write about it. The woman was Barbara Villiers, who was the Countess of Castlemaine, and he later writes about having that exact erotic dream about her in 1665, in which he describes it as one of the best dreams he ever dreamt, and also that he was admitted to use all of the dalliances with her. Hey, hey. The famed diarist even writes where he was caught diddling the maid in 1668, and this happened so much and this affair was so withstanding that eventually the wife caught him, and uh, shamed though he was, it's the girl, Deb, who lost her job. Oh dear me, Mr. Samuel Pepys. But the thing is, these personal stories would have slipped through the eyes of everybody. It could have been just like any other little girl's diary, with no historical relevance at all. However, he happened to live through both the Great Plague and the Great Fire of 1666. So his diaries, which are, like I said, of penthouse fame, are also kind of infamous for historians because they include a wide variety of information, including the mundane and the everyday, to give us a better understanding of the life that he was living in and the life that everybody else had during what would be two of the most important parts of British history. He chronicled everything. But before we get there, let's start at the beginning. London was one of the largest cities in all of Europe. In fact, it was also one of the most highly populated, densely populated, in fact. Sanitation was pretty much useless. People got sick all the time, and because people were literally on top of each other, and figuratively, uh, they basically would, the plague would spread through the town like the plague. Uh, hence where the term probably comes from. 
But the city was also filled with rubbish and waste, waste literally being thrown out the window onto the streets. It was a recipe for disaster. Sanitation is a joke and healthcare is basically to be cured by thoughts, prayers and magic. So yeah, it was a recipe for disaster. And this disaster was warned to them by a comet, which they saw in 1664. Uh, comets and British people tend not to mix. They tend to be a portent of doom. Uh, Pepys described in his journal from 1664, Mighty talk there is of this comet that is seen in nights, and the king and queen did sit up last night to see it, and did, it seems, and tonight I have thought to have done so too, but it is cloudy. Better luck next time. As a side note, while this is happening, he's writing in his journal detailing how proud he is about the new mirror he bought for the dining room. Like I said, comets and British folk don't mix. For example, in 1066, it is rumored that a comet blazed across the sky and was blamed for the Saxons losing the Battle of Hastings. The marking up on the top of this tapestry supposedly reads, They marvel at the star. The Great Plague of 1665 was not the first, second, third, or even fourth outbreak of the plague that the British folk would have to deal with. In fact, from 1348 up until 1665, London had over 30 outbreaks of plague. And it's first mentioned in his diaries in May of 1665 and sadly becomes a normal part of his everyday. Hence to the coffee house with Creed, he writes, where I have not been in a great while, where all the news is of the Dutch being gone out and of the plague growing upon us in this town. By June of 1665, the plague continues to infiltrate the town with Sam seeing two or three houses marked with a giant red cross and the words, Lord have mercy, written upon it. Uh, the incubation for the plague could take anywhere between four and six days. So if you saw one of these doors with the red marking, guaranteed somebody was sick inside and probably not going to get out. In fact, if your kid was sick and you weren't, you were all locked in the house. Never mind this quarantine nonsense. You were all literally locked and tied in the house. If you didn't have it, you were going to get it. People start going into quarantine and their homes become shut up by the plague. However, you would think that this would slow down Sam's libido a little bit. In fact, it does quite the opposite. He totally finds a correlation between sex and death and debauchery and lechery reign supreme, dear watchers. In fact, it would race wildly through his mind especially once his wife fled the city as a result of the plague. He writes in July of 1665 when he goes on a pub crawl and picks up some hot young ladies. He writes, And I to the harp and ball, and there stayed a while talking to Mary, and so home to dinner. After dinner to the Duke of Albemarle's again, and so to the Swan, and there demurrait un peu de temps con la fille, which loosely translates into spending time with a hot chick. And so to the harp and ball, and alone, demurrait un peu de temps, baissant la, spending some time kissing or screwing, depending upon your translation. And so away home and late to the office about letters, resolving from this night forward to close all my letters, if possible, and end all of my business at the office by daylight, and I shall go near to do it and put all my affairs in the world in good order. That it is much to be feared how a man can escape having a share with others in it for which the good Lord God bless me, or to be fitted to receive it. So while he's fooling around with barmaids, he's pretty realistic that this plague could get and kill him too. So he figures he should settle his affairs. At this point, a lot of the rich folk leave the cities. They haul ass. And starting in May, when Pepys begins to write an account of all the people had died, it was 43 people had died of plague in May. By August, over 17,000 had died killing off nearly 15% of London's population. And there were so many that cemeteries were overcrowded and carts would come by and say, bring out your dead. He begins to write consistently about how desolate the streets are and complains that some of his favorite pubs are now closed. However, he also describes seeing death on a regular basis and describes on a trip to Greenwich in 1665 in seeing a coffin in his way. But despite plague doors and body counts, and life's daily rituals continued. For example, weddings. Things still happen, despite the fact of the devastation. He writes above about witnessing an actual wedding during all of this. And then he also writes how profitable plague times have been for him. He's making mad money during all of this. And he has never lived so merrily as he has done during plague time, as his net worth goes up. January of 1665, his wife also writes that she's so bored that she's redecorating their bedroom. And then the fire. 
the fire, the Great London Fire of 1666, at 1 a.m. on a Sunday morning in a bakery in Pudding Lane, because of course it's named Pudding Lane. It is possibly to have been caused by a spark from an oven, and it became spread throughout the town really quickly because it was a particularly dry summer in London that year. And again, we've got people living on top of each other. It burned from September 2nd up until September 6th and destroyed over 70,000 homes, although remarkably they say that only six people had died. However, it should be noted that those six people were probably the only people that were recorded. Uh, Anybody that died that was poor, they probably just didn't write about it. He describes the fire as, so near the fire as we could for smoke, and all over the Thames, with one's face in the wind, you were almost burned with a shower of fire drops. And he continues to write at length about how devastating and simultaneously beautiful this fire was. While everybody runs to their home when a fire happens, you try to grab the thing that means the most to you. And for most people, that means things like photo albums. But in lieu of photography not even being invented yet, Samuel Pepys runs and grabs the following objects. His expensive wine, his papers, his gold, oh yeah, and a giant, massive wheel of Parmesan cheese, which he buries in the ground so nobody else can get it. Cheese was stupid expensive and also a sign of how wealthy he really was. We don't have anything written in the records, though, to say as to whether or not he was able to dig the cheese up and sample it at a later time. His last entry from 1669, he describes once again flirting with women and other such proclivities. And I'm going to use the term loosely. And going to, once again, another pub, The World's End, a drinking house by the park. And they're merry and so home late. His last entry in May of 1669 is because Samuel Pepys thought he was going blind. Thanks to the work of Samuel Pepys, we have a full-length description of the world around the Great Plague of 1665, Uh, in a way that sounds uh, very similar to kind of what we have going on outside these days during the quarantine of 2020. And the Great Fire of London and the details surrounding the plague are downright scary how similar they are. The pubs closing up, the lack of theater options, seeing coffins on a daily basis. I live in New York. I've been seeing this all the time. So, yeah, the thing is, is that it also shows an astounding amount of resilience. We lived through it once. We wrote about it, we're living through it again, and we'll write about it again, and we'll chronicle it for people for future generations. Subsequently, his Dear Penthouse-style entries, there were so many of which that it's filled not one, not two, but several BBC radio programs and television shows. His diaries show the devastation of two of the most gutting events in all of British history, but it also shows that resilience that the human spirit is known for, and despite it all, life uh, finds a way. But when you write about these things in your own quarantine experience, keep in mind that these journals don't show Sam in the most flattering light. He was a bit of a hound dog, constantly cheating on his wife, and was really more obsessed about the money he was making. However, dear watcher, when writing your own account of your time in quarantine, be careful what you write. Because those journals will tell future generations everything they need to know about the quarantine and the coronavirus responses. But they might not need to know about how you broke quarantine for sex all the tacos you ate without wearing any pants, or how much you enjoy the Tiger King. You might not want people to know that. Because right now, history has its eyes on us. So, raise a glass to the world we live in now and how we can make it better. Cheers, mates. Stay safe. May all your wine be tasty.